Hi, welcome to Bolt for Life. I am Garrett Bolt, actor, personal trainer, former powerlifter, pro wrestler, and chronic pain thriver. Bolt for Life is a podcast about living with the challenges of chronic pain. Our goal is to acknowledge, inspire, and relate to people living with chronic pain. I believe it is not only possible to survive, but to live a full life and thrive with chronic pain. No matter where you are in your journey, our mission is to give you the information and inspiration that will help you become Bolt for Life. Hey guys, today I want to talk a little bit about some of my past and some of you guys know that I do some modeling and acting and I started, man, over 20 years ago and I had been professional wrestling and my ex-wife came up with this idea. She said, why don't you try something where you don't get beat up so much? And that was kind of what got me started into modeling and acting. And I really started out um, just modeling, doing commercial print in the Chicagoland area and up in Milwaukee. And it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. And and it led me, it actually, strangely enough, it led me back to WCW, World Championship Wrestling, where I played a police officer and I had to arrest Hulk Hogan. So that was one of my first speaking jobs that I had. And I had, at one point, I think I had six agencies in Chicago. I had two in New York and one in Florida. Um, I didn't expect when I started modeling and acting that it would take me from working promotions at the drag races uh, all the way to being on stage at the Lyric Opera of Chicago and just about every medium in between, really. So it it opened up a whole new world to me, which was um, which was great. And it was better than getting hit with folding chairs. But (laughs) so we actually I actually did two bits with them. The first one was at the United Center in Chicago, and that was part of uh, Spring Stampede, which is a big event that they used to have. That was a pay-per-view event. And we had to separate him and Eric Bischoff. They were in a fight in the dressing room. And I fortunately got a hold of Eric Bischoff, which was much better than getting a hold of Hulk Hogan because <laughs> he's a big dude, man. I mean, you know, I'm a big guy, but he's he's big, and he wasn't even in his prime then. Um, so I think me and another guy got Eric Bischoff, and then the other five officers got Hulk Hogan. You know, the thing is they didn't tell Hulk Hogan beforehand that, we were going to pull our prop guns on him, so he didn't know that. And once the cameras cut, he was very upset and vocal about that. <laughs> but <laughs> he didn't like that part. Um, but everybody was great. It was a lot of fun. And then they, they booked us a couple nights later up in Rockford, Illinois, at the Metro Center. And that was part of the Monday Night Raw. And there we literally had to block the entrance with Hulk Hogan. They had... Uh, cop cars brought on set we had to drive up into the scene we had to block the scene and i had to confront hulk hogan say mr hogan you're not allowed in here tonight and you know we had this big stare down and long story short i lost (laughs) and he made it inside the metro center uh but it was great man we had a blast and it was great to be a part of that at that level i had a chance to be, I auditioned for a part at the Lyric Opera of Chicago. They were hiring bodybuilders to play an engine crew in Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. And that was a really cool experience because I had never, I, I had done like a, you know, a little bit of theater in high school. I kind of played around with it. I always had an interest in performing, but had not really pursued it. So being on stage in front of 3,000 people live with the music and the voices and everything was just an incredible experience. And um, and I learned a lot about opera, and I later worked on a couple other productions. Um, I worked on um, Verdi's Macbeth with Franz Grunheimen, and I played. Mostly I slept a lot of dead bodies around. That's pretty much what I did. I carried dead bodies. And I, I, actually, the beginning of Macbeth, I was killed in the opening battle scene by Macbeth, which was pretty cool since I had some... They considered my professional wrestling stage combat experience, so <laughs> that's what I did. I got... Killed in the beginning, and then the other acts, I changed changed costumes and slept dead bodies, but it was fun. That was in the Chicagoland area. Um, I worked in around there, and there was a lot of commercial print work, so I did a uniform catalog for the Salvation Army. I did um, brochures for different companies, um, credit card inserts. I did, oh, for a while I was on the Home Medics Back Massager. My back and shoulder were on the packaging for one of their products. So it was a lot of different jobs. I did a couple of TV commercials. One of them I played a wrestler, which was which was fun. 
And, uh, and then I'd go up to also Milwaukee is only a couple hours from Chicago. And that was a pretty decent market. Um, television. I did Wisconsin state lottery commercial and, um, and then in Chicago, we also have the McCormick center, which is a huge convention center, one of the largest in the country. So occasionally we had chance to, um, work uh doing promotions and things like that at the convention centers and one of them which i still say is probably the best job i ever had was um the company wall that makes the hair clippers they had come out with a line of personal body massagers and our job me and two of the girls we had to um man the booth which was basically set up to look like someone's living room and they were in their nightgowns and i was in just pajama pants and our jobs were to massage each other excuse me i'm getting a little, little <laughs> flustered there, excuse me. <laughs> massage each other and then tell people about the massagers as they came over to watch, which a lot of people did. We drew a lot of crowds. <laughs> so it was it was a fun job. Actually, my agent came out that day to check on us, and she said, you know what, you should be paying me to do this job. You get to be here with these beautiful women massaging them all day. And uh, I, I do not disagree. It was a great job. But so... NBC Squawk Box was going around and they were doing um, they were doing like little bits and inserts for their show and stuff. So they came by and they recorded us and the girls were talking about the back massagers and I'm massaging them. And so the thing thing came out great. And we actually they told us when it was going to be on. We set our VCR. So I have a recording of it somewhere on VHS tape. But the next day we got I think it was like a I think it was a four or five day show. So the day after that aired, um, we we showed up to the <laughs> we showed up to McCormick Place and um, our managers the people handling us were like okay um, the hires up called and they saw you on TV and we got to put more clothes on you guys we got to change your outfits they thought this was a little too racy so so we had to change wardrobe the last couple of days but um, it, it was a lot of fun and the the best part about that show was I had the chance to meet uh, Jack Lalane. Um, famous, uh, really the original fitness guy, you know, and uh, he was there promoting his juicer. And at the time, so this was over 20 years ago, he was probably in his 80s, probably mid 80s. And uh, he's since passed away now, but he um, he was there. And, and what an incredible experience that was to get to talk to him. And and it was a it was a trade show, but it was it was closed to the public. So it was very um wasn't super packed. We were on our break. I went over there with the girls and we got to meet them. And, uh, and I had the chance to just talk with them. And it's just so inspiring, you know, and it was so, he's so cool. He's like, he's in the, the whole jumpsuit and everything, you know, and he's like, wow, he's like, you're in great shape. What do you do to work out? I'm like, oh my God, Jack Lane is asking me what I do to work out, you know? And, um, and he was just, just so cool and so down to earth. And he was telling me that, um, and you could see like when he started talking about working out, like his eyes just lit up. And he was saying, you know, he's like, he's like, you know, I try to do something every day. He said, I've, I've preached health and exercise my whole life. He's like, if I didn't do something, I'd feel like a hypocrite, you know. And uh, I believed he he lived into his early 90s. And uh, when the and just fun fact, the jumping jack is named after Jack Lalane, you know, and probably. 60% of the machines that are in the gyms today, the original designs came from Jack LaLanne. He uh, started his own gym and, uh, and developed a lot of the modern exercise equipment. So, um, so that was a great, a great experience. You know, it was, I think, you know, kind of reflecting on it, one of the coolest things about the modeling and acting was, um, was really the people that I got to meet and the situations that, that I, I got to experience um, just, just for doing that. You know, when, when I had the accident with my back, I had um, taken a little bit of a break from, from modeling and acting. I had done a little bit of acting, and I, I wanted to, to really focus on powerlifting. And um, I, I got booked in one job. I was like 250 pounds, and um, they, they wanted to use a girl that was larger framed. So I made a fit with that. But I was kind of taking a break, and I really wanted to focus back on powerlifting. And, and that's when my accident happened. So um, with that... I really, um, you know, uh, the, the modeling and acting and everything really went to the wayside. So, so, you know, through moving out to the East Coast and living up in Connecticut and more surgeries and more conditions and, and other consequences um, eventually brought us, you know, down to the Southeast. And I had been working after my second fusion to get back and I was um, working with people with chronic injuries and diseases, doing in-home personal training sessions. Um, but it was killing me. Like it was killing me. Just you know, bringing the equipment out. I had a little travel suitcase, um, being on my feet for an hour, 
even modified. So the idea was after I started um, training people with chronic injuries and chronic disease and chronic pain, um, I couldn't do what I used to be able to do, and they couldn't do what they used to be able to do. So by modified, we do a lot of stuff in home, so I could work with people where they could where they could function and where they could move. Um, so even with a modified thing, like let's say I'd have somebody doing seated curls as opposed to standing curls, or we do something that might be normally standing, we might see if we could do a variation lying. But that still meant that I had to be there. I was. I had to be to keep them safe. I had to make sure they didn't drop a weight on themselves. I had to make sure that they were doing things right. And, and it was wearing me out. It was wearing me out. It, it was it was tough. And it, and it was a, a commitment, a, a regular commitment that I had to keep and I had to follow. And my wife Beth said, well, why don't you see if you can get an agency down here? You know, there's at, at the time there was a bit of a, a film community here in Wilmington and things were picking up down in Atlanta and the southeast. And I, I had no idea. I had mostly worked in um, the Chicago market and the New York market for a little while. And so what the heck? So I started looking around and I found an agent here in North Carolina. And what I found was that I could have a lot more control over my schedule with modeling and acting. And it doesn't seem there's not quite the market for the print work that I did in Chicago and Milwaukee and the New York area and stuff. But there was a lot of TV and there's a lot of video. And so it would give me... um, a chance where I could kind of control the schedule. I had choice over whether I would submit to a job or commit to a job. If I did do a job, I would have, you know, I, I might do a job, a day, sometimes a one or two or three day job, and then I might, might be off for a week or two weeks, you know, and I could I could take care of my family responsibilities and myself and be able to pace things. And then, you know, the biggest reason I had to get an agent when I started back was I couldn't believe how much the how much it had changed you know it used to be uh, we all used comp cards and we used headshots and you stapled a resume to it and you know you would if you got a call for an audition you know like when I lived in the Chicago area I had to drive into the city go down to the casting agency and audition with you know two dozen other people that look like me and now it's changed so much in that they'll still do um you know, in-person castings, but most of the initial stuff is uh, self-tape videos. And on top of that, besides the agencies doing a lot of the footwork, there's a lot of casting uh, websites in different areas where you can go to find jobs and jobs are posted. So the business changed so much. And, you know, as Brian, our producer knows, I am not the most technologically advanced person on the planet. <laughs> so it's been a big, <laughs> a big learning curve for me, but it was great for me to get back working a modeling act in my first job back was for a Christian television show called um, Sid Roth's It's Supernatural. And I played the father of a missing girl. It's kind of like a miracle reenactment show. And they shoot, their studios are in Charlotte, and my sister-in-law and niece live in Charlotte, which is great. So I've been on the show, I think, five times. And that was a great, it was great to get back on a set. You know, it was great to get back in front of the camera. It was great to perform. And it was really, really fulfilling. You know, to be able to do that, especially after everything I'd been through and that that second fusion uh, that went horribly wrong, it, it was a really big accomplishment. And it also gave me a lot of motivation to start working out of the leg brace, the AFO that I've worn for you know five years. Um, was what I found with that first job was is that it would squeak when it, so I'm I'm on camera. You know, we've got audio going and my leg brace is squeaking. That's not cool. So. It was a lot of motivation for me to continue to work to try to get out of it. And then the other motivation was to trim up and lose a little bit of weight. I, I wasn't in horrible shape, but I knew that I could lose a little, a little bit of weight. And I'm down probably, probably 16, 17 pounds since I first started two years ago. So it's been a process, but it's just been really motivating. I, you know, the option of pushing myself in the personal training world, I had been down that road already, you know, and I didn't want to repeat the same mistakes that I've made so many times is that I keep pushing and pushing and pushing until something breaks, uh, literally or figuratively, and I explode or I lose my temper or I, I, you know, I hurt someone, I hurt myself or, you know, th- those are all horrible options, you know, and I'm glad that I was able and with the help of my wife Beth to kind of see that and have the foresight to say, look, this isn't working. And I, I made changes in, in my schedule and who I was training and how often I was training and to the point where it's like, well, now 
you know, does the benefit of this outweigh the risk, you know? And that's what I try to do with everything in life now is, you know, what's the risk to benefit ratio? Is, is this, is the risk of what I'm doing, is it worth the benefit that I'm getting from it? And it just, it just didn't balance out, you know? Now, I've, I've had to make some tough choices getting back into model and acting because, as you may have guessed, I'm very competitive and, and I like that part of it and that's been good. But when, you know, I, I have to watch myself that, oh, I can do this job in Knoxville, Tennessee, and then I can be back down in Atlanta by, you know, six o'clock the next day, and then I could, and no, I can't, you know, so let's not, let's not do that. That's not an option. Quite often I play military, I play law enforcement. I felt like it was a sign for me that I needed to change a little bit of different direction. I was working as a SWAT team member on the new Dynasty series that's being filmed in Atlanta, and they had eight of us, and I knew two of the guys that had worked with them before. We had played police officers before, and we were having a great evening. It was a night shoot, and we were going through. We were sweeping the area, and I was doing okay with it. I'm like, okay, we're getting some breaks. And then they threw us in the SWAT truck, and the SWAT truck was in every scene we had done before that. So, like, you know, the SWAT truck was sitting there. They had done some scenes where the SWAT truck would come flying in, and then we were sweeping the area. So it was time where we had to shoot the scene where we come out of the SWAT truck. So... We had no rehearsal, and they pile us all into the back of the truck. And it's a prop truck, so it looks like a SWAT truck, but it's not a, really a SWAT truck. And um, the stunt driver goes flying in just like he had done all the other times. And we we land, and one of the seats wasn't bolted down, and these two... 200 pound guys come flying and landing on top of me and we're all bundled in the bag and you know everybody's going go 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 so we get up and we file out and and it looked fine but you know one of the guys cut his cheek you know i got landed on it was kind of like you know what maybe i need to start thinking about what i'm doing here because i'm putting myself in situations where i could, I could potentially get hurt and fortunately i was okay from that uh, but it it changed yeah what i started to uh accept and audition for but you know what my motto is? It's better to be typecast than no cast. <laughs> so, <laughs> but even having said that, though, in the last year and through this last surgery that I've had, um, I had some time off and I've been able to work on my diet. And I've trimmed up a little bit more, which I think gives me a little bit more mainstream look. And um, you know, I've had a few chances to, to play the father or um, you know, to play a construction worker or things like that. I'm not quite all, um, you know gung-ho military law enforcement but um but you know i've enjoyed the roles that, I, that i've gotten one of my subspecialties in modeling over the years since i started was hand modeling which was to me like the most ridiculous thing because when i started i was working my day job was in construction i was working as a ceramic tile setter uh in chicago so i was always really self-conscious about my hands because they're in the thin set mortar they're in the grout you know what i mean you wear gloves but they get dried out so um I started getting auditions for hands, especially back like in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, they were coming out with a lot of technology that they wanted to make look smaller. So they were looking for guys with really big hands. So I started getting these auditions and the guys would make fun of me because I would bring lotion and I'd have like all these gloves and all this different stuff. I got my chops busted for that. But I actually booked some, some really great hand modeling jobs. So when I met my wife, Beth, I was telling her about, you know, modeling and acting. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And um, I also I've done a bunch of hand jobs. And she's like, what? It's like, what? <laughs> I'm like, I mean, hand modeling jobs. <laughs> she's like, so the important thing if you do any hand modeling is to remember to specify the modeling part when you talk about hand modeling jobs. So um, but it was really cool. I actually um I did a billboard for the Waukesha Wisconsin Memorial Hospital for their neonatal ward, and I had to hold a, uh, a premature baby, little Michael, and he just he barely fit in my hand, and we had to do it in the incubator, and we had two nurses there with us, and the parents were there, and they they were comfortable with everything, but it was really kind of an honor, you know, to, to do that, and um, so it was another one of those cool experiences that, you know, I normally wouldn't... Uh, wouldn't wouldn't get to do but um i think motorola came out with a palm pilot so I, I did a couple spots with them um make the palm pilot look smaller and that kind of stuff but um but yeah so subspecialty hand modeling <laughs> job <laughs> the prince came out so well that actually the director of the hospital she had a baby a couple years later and she loved that picture so much they actually hired me to come up and take a similar picture with their baby who was not a preemie, but they liked the look with my hands and stuff, so I, I ended up doing that. 
the photographer that did that job actually um, sent me a print. So I actually have a poster size print at home that we have framed of um, my hand holding that beautiful little baby. But yeah, and then I even recently getting back into um, modeling and acting, I've done a couple commercials um, where I was signing checks in a banking commercial and tomorrow I'm going up to Raleigh um, to do a job for the Christian Broadcasting Network. So I'm supposed to be the hands of God. Don't let that go to my head. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, just something again. I never would have thought that I would that I could do, but something that also I can do. You know, I mean, hand modeling jobs are much easier for me to do than um, you know, like the old print jobs I used to do, like for Coles, where you have to stand there, you have to change ten different outfits, you have to do all these different standing poses. So, you know, it's something that. You know, fortunately, I can do. I mean, I think it's important for people to figure out what you like, figure out what you enjoy first, you know, like really, what do you want to do? I mean, for some people, maybe it's video games, you know, okay, so you like video games. Well, what can you do or what can you do that involves video games that can help you to meet your goals, you know? So for me, if that was me, I'd be like, well, you know what? I have chronic pain, I have video games, I can play video games, but what if I went to a convention or what if I set a goal and I want to go out and, you know, meet this at this you know, video game player at this place where you sign an autograph, you know, something like that. I think it's so important to find things that motivate you. When I got back into to modeling and acting, one of the things I started doing was extra work. And I swore when I did, I did extra work years ago. You're like the low people on the totem pole, you know, you, you eat last, everything, you know. It's like the hours are crazy. They keep you stuck there. It's just like, oh, I never want to do that. But I, I did some of it to get back into it. And I met a ton of people in the business, especially down in Atlanta. But what I started finding is that, first of all, I don't really like doing extra work anymore. It, prior to this last back surgery, I actually enjoyed it. It was great. If I had the time and if the job was worth it and paid well enough or if it was a featured spot, I would do it. And I, I, I would have a lot of fun with it. After this last back surgery, um, it, it just hasn't been the case. You know, I don't, I don't want to spend 10 or 12 hours on set unless it's really worth it for me. One of the things I found through meeting people and talking with people, especially at some of them, we call them cattle calls, where they need like a big crowd or they need a big group of people. But you meet a lot of different people. And I have met so many people with chronic pain and chronic diseases that they can't work. They're on disability. But even on disability, you can make up to $17,000 a year. So they can go out and they can do a few background jobs you know they can be extras in a movie and and it gives them something to get out of the house and it's the same thing with me is like now I got out of the house I might have worked a couple of days on the show I got to meet some famous people yeah I might be in the movie made it made a little bit of money now I can rest I think it's a great thing and it's pretty cool that I've seen and I've been fortunate enough to meet a lot of different people with a lot of different issues that that do background work it's been motivating for me to know that we're doing the podcast and we're, we're reaching out to people and that's been a, a great structured thing that I've looked forward to where we've been able to record and work on episodes. It's been a great thing for me uh, moving forward, especially from this last surgery. It's, it's given me something to focus on and work on and put my energy into. And now, now that I'm getting back to work, I do think about, oh, wow, like, you know, what, what can we share with, with the listeners? What can we share with people that are listening to the podcast? Um, which is which is really cool. I would love for the Bolt for Life podcast to be something like modeling and acting is for me in the sense that it can be something that we can all work towards. It's something we can be a part of. And I would love for people to get involved and contact us and reach out to us. I mean, maybe that's a start. You know, if you're stuck and you're in a really bad, dark place, you know, reaching out a little bit, getting some help, know that you're not alone and, and come and let us know where you're at. You know, I just saw on our Facebook page, that there was a new comment and there was a new review and it was really really inspiring and positive to me and this person had put on there that she felt really inspired by the podcast and that it was really helping her and that when she felt really down she would listen to some of the episodes and I'm like wow now that's cool you know I mean and if that's a great start for her maybe it can be for more people as we'd love to hear from all of you guys. Be involved. Give us some ideas. Work on how we can make this better and how we can help more people. And in the process, you're helping yourself. You know, that's what it's done for me. And that's why we have so many different avenues that you can contact us through Facebook, through Instagram, um, BoatForLife.com, any of those places you can reach out to us and get involved. We want to make this a community and something that everybody can share in. 
So, you know, when looking for something to do and something to, you know, purpose, right? We all need purpose. And and for me, I, I find so much fulfillment in being able to model and act. And then, like, we're just talking about the hand modeling specialty. And, you know, I just want to encourage people, you know, to find out what you can do. You know, the, the great thing for, about me getting back into modeling and acting now, being here in the southeast, there, there's a lot of work. I have to travel a little bit. But... It's the technology that makes it possible for me to be able to do it. You know, if I had to drive to Atlanta for every audition I get, it wouldn't be as doable. You know, but because of the technology, the phone, I can actually do an audition right on my phone, a self-tape audition. And it, it, it allows me a lot more option. And I want to encourage people to take advantage of the technology that we have. And, you know, whether it's, you know, look, you know, look around. If there's something that you see that you really like that you, you would want to endorse, maybe you can be a hand model or maybe you can do something. You can contact that company and see. There's a lot of um, at-home work out there, too, now if you have technology. There's... Um, um, and, and not even anything that, you know, the issue f with me holding down a full-time job is that I, I don't have the endurance and the stamina to do it, you know. So the key for me is finding something that I can do that works within my limitations. So I think technology is a huge tool to be able to help us to do that. And, you know, and reach out. What does it hurt to, you know, send a couple emails? You know, I, I've something I can do sitting, resting at home, which I need to do anyhow. I'm going to be in that chair anyhow. If I can do something productive and, and maybe and maybe something will work out, you know, I mean, you know, I have to say I have auditioned for a lot of jobs in the last two years. And I've been fortunate that I've gotten a fair amount, but I auditioned for a lot. We used to say on average you would get about one out of every ten. And now with technology, I have no idea what that number is, but it's much, much higher because you're also competing against a larger group. But the point is, is that if I don't do it, I'm not going to get the job, you know, and, and not everyone's going to be, you know, a great positive response. So the more I get out there, the more I'm doing, the more I'm increasing my chances. And, and I feel like I'm doing something. I'm like, hey, I did it. I put it out there, you know. So I know not everybody's going to be into modeling and acting and, and that might not be your thing. But I want to encourage you guys to go out and find something that you're passionate about and look at the things you can do and put some work into it. You know, move towards bettering yourself and, and find what drives you and what, what your passion is. Is You know, is there something that, that you enjoy doing? Do you, um, do you write? Can you write short stories? Can you um, paint? Do you like painting or drawing? Uh, or have you ever wanted to? That's what modeling and acting has done for me is giving me something that I need to challenge me and something for me to look forward to. And also to have an identity, you know, that's one of the biggest issues I had when I couldn't work full time when I when I first, you know, had to get out of personal training and then kind of went through the second time here where I had that transition and I was able to go into modeling and acting, but I lost my identity. It's like, you know, my wife Beth, she said something very important to me. She said, you know, you're more than your job. You're more than the weights you've lifted. You're more than your accomplishments, you know, and that was like, wow, okay, that's, that's so true, you know, and I, I can work as I can I can work, I can focus on that, on building that part of me, but now what am I going to do with it, you know, or how am I, how am I going to continue to cultivate that? How am I going to find something that, you know, I can tell my son about and be proud about, you know, or be able to share with somebody, you know, I, I, it's been so tough in chronic pain and meeting new people or, you know, moving to a new place and you meet people and you're talking to, you know, people at your same age and, uh, and they're like, oh, what do you do? Oh, I have a broken back. You know, it's like, well, you know, it's just, so it's been, it's been, and it still is a process for me to, to redefine who I am, you know, and it's not just the things that I do, but the things that I do help me to figure out who I am. So I just want to say to everybody is that, you know, you're, you're more than your job or you're more than just the material stuff, you know, and I think it's important to say too, that you're more than the pain. It becomes so consuming and so overwhelming that you know you deal with chronic pain it, it doesn't stop it's always there it's changed my whole life it's what I have have to talk about until I start to expand my horizons and still until I build on it until I get to a place where now I, I have a baseline and I can start to build off of and grow I think really finding out who we are you know we're more than more than just the chronic pain we're more than just a suffering person and 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 we're more than just what we used to be too you know um that what i used to be doesn't define who i am today what i do today defines who i am today you know and dealing with this this disease and the, the chronic pain issues that i have is the big it's been the biggest challenge of my life but it doesn't mean that i can't 
I can't continue to grow and I can't continue to build on the person I am. You know, it's like we were joking about this before we started recording. I, and I said, you know, my mother used to say when things were tough, she'd say, well, it builds character, you know, it builds character. And it's true. It does build character. You know, she always said it kind of funny to lighten the situation. And, and it kind of did. And But it's true. You know, um, tough times, bad stuff. It does build character. So this isn't just about me and my journey with chronic pain. I really want this to be about all of you guys. And I mean, what have you found that, what what passion have you found? Are you um, at a place where you've been able to enjoy some things that you used to be able to do and you couldn't because of pain and now you're back to it? Or have you found some new things that you can do and that you really enjoy something that that's fulfilling to you something that gives you some purpose and some sense of accomplishment and if you have i mean we'd love to hear from you we really want this to to be a community where we can all kind of help each other because i know i can't do this alone and and i hope that none of you have to do it alone get in touch with us guys let us know what's working for you so that we can connect and we can share and hopefully all help each other we appreciate you listening to bolt for life In future episodes, we'll be talking to chronic pain professionals, doctors, and plenty of other inspiring guests to help you on your journey in chronic pain. Our goal is to help you or anyone that you might know to live and thrive with chronic pain. And you can help us out by subscribing or giving us a review on iTunes or anywhere else that you hear Bolt for Life. If you guys have any ideas, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to us at info at boltforlife, B-U-L-T-F-O-R, life.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, Bolt for Life. Thanks again. This is Garrett Bolt for Bolt for Life.